Okay, thank you for coming, and uh, I'm sure that we will have a lot of fun today. So just for the agenda, uh, <coughs> Manolis will uh, give a 10 minutes uh, briefing about uh, the general uh, effort of the Educational Task Force, and then Yel Pat will give us uh, two uh, talks, one of the art of high quality teaching, uh, uh, and uh, which is a general view of teaching, and then will uh, it, it will present is a, a view of teaching computer architecture from bottom up, and uh, I hope that it will address also or mention is a great book on that. Uh, we will have a coffee break, and after the a coffee break, Sean will give us a different uh, perspective, which is a top-down approach, and we'll, uh, uh, later on we'll summarize and question and answers, and uh, I am sure that we will have a lot of fun. So, please. So, uh, a few very quick uh, words. This tutorial has been organized by the Task Force on Education and Training of uh, HIPIC. Uh, the goal of this task force is to improve university education and training of professionals on the topics of the HIPIC uh, network. Um, we hold uh, meetings uh, two to four times per year during the HIPIC meetings. Uh, we exchange experiences and recommendations, so I invite you to participate, to get involved and participate in those meetings. Um, we are collecting uh, educational material that is available, publicly available on the web and uh, through the web page of this uh, task force there are uh, pointers to that material. Uh, if you have material of yours or uh, of others that you want to recommend, please let us know, let me know and I will put them on the web page, uh, we put URLs on the web page. Um, we are organizing this tutorial and uh, there is the idea of possibly organizing sometime in the future a competition on how to best explain some difficult topics, for example, out-of-order instruction execution uh, in a short period of time and clearly uh, for people to understand what is the best way to explain them sometime in the future perhaps. So please get involved and contribute. So, um, about today, our task force uh, had selected uh, since long time ago and independent of this year's conference, uh, Yale Pat to be uh, our first speaker. Uh, Yale Pat is professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Texas at Austin and he holds the Ernest Cockerell Jr. Centennial Chair. Uh, he has been teaching for 44 years he is recipient of the year 2000 ACM Carl Karlstrom Outstanding Educator Award and he is author with Sanjay Patel of the book Introduction to Computing Systems from Bits and Gates to Sea and Beyond. And he will be lecturing to us about two topics, teaching in general, recommendation on teaching in general, and then the bottom-up approach. Thank you, Manolos. Why? I've never understood clapping beforehand. You have no idea how I'm going to do. So, uh, the art of teaching. Uh, the title was picked by Manolis, and I thought that it was a brilliant uh, title because it's the art of teaching as opposed to the science of teaching. In fact, uh, permeate, pervasive in my comments are going to be things that I think indicate that it's an art and not a science and in fact sometimes it's a good idea to uh, turn a deaf ear to what some of the I call them educators uh, would-be educators people who uh, study education but have never been in the trenches uh, so I thought your title was just outstanding you know Knuth called his uh, thing the art of uh, computer programming yeah and the more cases you have, in the case of teaching, the more times you're in a classroom, uh, the better you are at it. You know, the art of uh, practicing medicine, for example, the art of being a computer architect designing computers, the art of being a, an architect designing buildings. Anyway, so I'm a teacher at the University of Texas at Austin. 
What I hope to do today, uh, I must admit that this uh, was prepared, uh, was committed, I should say. It's been prepared over the last eight months since Manolis uh, suggested that uh, maybe it would be a good idea for me to do this, but it was committed this morning. I flew in yesterday, got a good night's sleep, had breakfast, and uh, prepared this. So uh, there's been no dry run, because there's never a dry run, as you know. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. So I thought I would start with uh, some uh, questions that they asked. I've been in two workshops recently, uh, one in India, sponsored by our National Science Foundation, and one in uh, the U.S., also sponsored by our National Science Foundation. They gave us a set of questions to answer to start things off. I don't know how relevant all the questions are to the European Union, but I thought I'd start with uh, the questions about education and then my responses. Admittedly, the questions were couched within the framework of uh, how do we start parallelism in the curriculum in the freshman year? You know, since these companies don't know anything, don't know how to design a chip any better than stepping the reticle and getting multiple cores in the chip, they now provide all these cores for us to have to somehow figure out what to do with. So parallelism is the magic word. And so the workshops were that, but I decided to turn it around, and instead of talking about parallelism, I would talk about what's really broken in the U.S. And then my Ten Commandments of Good Teaching, which uh, one of the people on your committee said we should spend five minutes on that. I don't know how I can spend less than two hours on that, but that's okay. And as I started going through my commandments, I discovered that I really have 11, 12, 13, 14, etc., and so I've got a slide on that. And then the use of high tech in the classroom, which is uh, most universities seem to be giving gold stars to faculty that will use high tech in the classroom. And it's usually the case that high tech gets in the way in the classroom. So I have something on that. And then I have some thoughts, and then I have some more thoughts, and I hope to do this in a short period of time. Uh, you can let me know when I've got 10 minutes left, and then when I've got five minutes left, because I have no idea how long it's gonna take, and that will better gauge me. If you had a clock that would count down to zero, that'd be better, but I guess we don't have that. So the questions were posed by NSF, uh, what should we teach? Eh? And the answer is fundamentals. In fact, it's another term you'll hear me use all the time. Fundamentals, more math, statistics, science. I don't know whether it's true in Europe, but in the U.S., uh, more, and more, uh, more and more computer science and engineering programs, which I've abbreviated CS&E in order to not run off the line, uh, in many, many of these uh, bullets, uh, have been uh, getting less and less math and physics and statistics, et cetera, in the curriculum. Uh, I don't know how you can be an engineer without math, but, you know, in the U.S., it's all about feeling good, and if you want to be an engineer, it doesn't matter whether you can do math or not. Uh, what should we not teach? Five languages, web design, Excel, the latest fact. In fact, one of my uh, new commandments is beware of fads. Uh, should we teach concepts or should we teach tools? These are all questions from NSF which I'm responding to. Uh, so uh, should we teach concepts or tools? By the way, you can always tell whether you're teaching concepts of tool or tools. See, if you're teaching concepts, they're reading the, the student newspaper, looking out the window, uh, 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 fooling around with their text messaging. Uh, etc. If you're teaching tools, then they're copying down carefully to make sure they get every step uh, in the tool. Uh, so what I say, I don't teach tools. Never teach tools. Why would I waste valuable class time teaching tools? Teach what they cannot learn on their own, assign what they can learn on their own, the tools, and most, most tools fall in this category. And most tools, by the way, will be gone by the time they graduate, and the, the new tools will be there, and then so you teach concepts, you assign tools, and then you apply tools to the concepts. And this parallelism thing which I related to earlier, are we doing such a poor job of teaching engineering, programming, critical thinking? Critical thinking, God forbid we should teach critical thinking in a university. Uh, the topics such as parallelism are the least of our worries, and the short answer is yes. And the problem is not enough information. Uh, emphasis on the fundamentals. Again, I don't know whether this is U.S. centric or whether it applies to Europe. If it does, great. Uh, there's too much sugarcoating because we're afraid we might lose enrollment. In fact, uh, one of my uh, hot buttons is that we, we really do kids a favor when we convince them to leave computer science and engineering if they don't belong. 
I met this kid in a pizza place uh, off campus, just off campus, and <coughs> it comes up to me, shakes me. Dr. Pat, I had you for the freshman course. I teach a freshman course every other fall, 400 freshmen, 10 TAs. Uh, and he's shaking my hand, I, and he's got big, uh, pumping my hand. And, and I say, uh, Would you, how'd you do? He says, I made a D. He says, why are you so happy? He said, because it convinced me I had no business in computer engineering, I've switched to history, and I've been getting A pluses ever since. <laughs> There's too much reliance on memorization. I don't know whether that's a European problem or not. It's certainly true in the U.S. In fact, one of the things I do in the freshman course is beat the memorization out of them because they've been rewarded all the way up to college for their ability to memorize. Too much teaching by those who don't get it. I can't understand this concept of being three pages ahead of the class. How can you possibly deal with any question in depth if you're three pages ahead of the class? A requirement for teaching a course ought to be that you understand the material of the course. Not necessarily true. Okay, what innovations in research will fundamentally change what we teach? So I think the operative word is fundamentally. Probably none. We should teach fundamentals. What computing research should we be doing to make our educational endeavors more successful? I'd say none. Spend quality time in the classroom. Pay attention to what works and what doesn't work. Uh, one of my uh, PhD, Eric Sprangle, he's now the chief architect of Larrabee, which, by the way, is not dead. It will continue. It's just, it, it's true. It's a, it's a, it's a good design. And uh, uh, the, the problem is you got technical people and you got yo-yos, and the decisions are made by yo-yos. Uh, and uh, you'll see that uh, they will. I don't know. Um, I guess we're going to hear a keynote. Uh, what tomorrow or Tuesday? It'll be interesting to see what he to hear what he has to say. Uh, but anyway, so uh, Eric comes to my lectures uh, every five years. And he says, the reason why I've started coming every five years is because every time you talk, uh, you change about 10%. And after five years, it's a whole new lecture. So that's a, po that's a feature, not a bug. The point is that when you're lecturing, you see what works, what doesn't work. What works, you keep for the next lecture, the next time you teach. And what doesn't work, you need to figure out how to do it right the next time. Uh, what role do, I don't know, what, so you, you guys have to have uh, pre-college, K through 12, we call it in my country. Uh, and what role do they have? They all can help if they would teach thinking and understanding and get rid of this memorization crap. Uh, so I ask, is it also a problem in Europe? In fact, we have a, it's a very serious problem in the U.S. In fact, uh, in the U.S., these high school kids take what we call AP courses, advanced placement. And if they do well, then they can pass out of courses in the university. They get university credit, so they can graduate in three years rather than four years of college, for example. And it doesn't work. And I see the kids in the freshman year. They've had all kinds of AP computer science, and yet you're clueless. So the good students are being turned off by that and the decreasing enrollments as they elect biology or finance or whatever. Um, because what they're getting in the high schools is memorization, and the good students want more than that. The good students want to know what's underneath the hood. Why does something work? Uh, new techniques and technologies, a boon or a bane to education, they're a bane. Too many are getting caught up in the glitz. The students don't need glitz. Are we meeting the needs of industry? <laughs> who cares? According to who? Now, our job is not to meet the needs of industry. Our job is to prepare the student for 40 years after he graduates. And to what extent is meeting industry's needs the role of an undergraduate ECCS education? And the only answer to that is, huh. The current state of education in the U.S., Microsoft has stated again and again they have a problem with our graduates. They won't, they, for every graduate they hire, they interview 100. They don't like our graduates. And it's not their lack of skill in Java and programming. It's their basic understanding of, of fundamentals. Uh, I was at a thing, Microsoft Summit, when they used to invite me before I got to be too obnoxious. And I was uh, pushing back against Bill Gates, and he said, what I want these kids, he says, is there anything that these kids could know that would help you uh, hire them? And he says, yeah, Master Knuth, Volume 1. I said, wow, Gates gets it, right? Because if you understand Knuth, Volume 1, then you know how these data structures are actually stored in memory. And how can you understand how well an algorithm is doing if you don't know what it's manipulating? So Gates says this. 
Uh, the best students do not elect CSNE in the U.S. It used to be that we had enrollment pressure in the other direction. Now we, we can't fill our classrooms. Uh, the best senior professors don't teach freshmen. They're do, too good to teach freshmen. I don't know whether that's a problem in Europe or not. And the funding agencies are pushing collaboration. You know, we should, we should be helping, we should be helping the biologists, the chemists, you know. Our job is a mechanic to build a better telescope so that they can see the uh, next galaxy. Is anyone paying attention to the core discipline? We continue to start with Java, which is awful for two very important reasons. And the curriculum is weak in math logic reasoning. That's the state of education in the US. No time for low-level stuff. Embrace the top up. Whoops. In fact, uh, we have a, a disagreement, I guess, of top down versus bottom up. Unfortunately, too much of education in my country, at least, is not top down, it's not bottom up, it's top up. And don't worry about architecture, compilers, operating systems, that's, that's boring. My mantra on education is the fundamentals is everything. If you get them right, everything else will follow. It's impossible to prepare a student for what that student's going to need for the next 40 years. And I would insist the hard core is hardware, software, the, the tools I'd like to see emphasize are math and science and that capstone to pull it all together before they graduate. My Ten Commandments of Good Teaching, which uh, I guess has been translated now into Spanish, Arabic, and some other languages. And what the hell is that down at the bottom? Uh, whoops, it went away. Good. So, I've already mentioned, if you don't own the material, what the hell are you doing in a classroom? How can you possibly teach if you, you can be the greatest teacher in the world, if you don't know what you're teaching, you're useless. I was an expert witness on a case, and they brought in this very high-powered defense, you know, this attorney to cross-examine me. He was clueless about the technology. In fact, his attitude was, I'm such a good lawyer, I don't need to know the technology. Well, it was a joke. I mopped up the floor with him. Why? Because I had a clue of what the technology was all about. So you don't know the material, forget it. Uh, you've, you actually ought to want to be there. You know, a former colleague of mine, he'd walk in a classroom, the first thing he'd do is look at his watch, and he would telegraph to the kids that, uh, you know, 49 more minutes and I can leave. And the kids pick up on that. Nothing, no substitute for enthusiasm. I'm told when I walk into a classroom, the students know I'd rather be no place else. Really makes a difference. Uh, genuinely respect your students, goes without saying. Set the bar high, no sugarcoating. If you set the bar high, the students will measure up to it. Don't give them tedious crap to do. You know, they'll turn off like crazy. But if they're learning, they'll work as many hours as it takes to master the material. And no, 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 nothing is served by setting a low bar. Understanding is good, memorizing is bad. I was visiting Yorktown, uh, Yorktown Heights. I don't know how many of you know the New York area, but for personal reasons, I flew in and out of Newark, picked up a car, drove to a hotel not far from uh, Yorktown. And uh, you don't want to be driving in uh, that area looking at a map. You know, you really need to put your, keep your eyes on the road, otherwise you'll never make it, you'll be dead. Right? So I memorized the directions from Newark Airport to the hotel close to Yorktown Heights. I got in very late at night, 2 o'clock in the morning, I pick up the car, and I head off for my hotel. Should take me about, I don't know, 40 minutes to get there. And the problem was I had only memorized the first 11 directions correctly, and that got me to within three miles of the hotel. And then I made a left turn instead of a right turn because I'd memorized incorrectly and spent the next three hours finding the hotel. If you don't memorize 100%, it doesn't work. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ugh. Take responsibility for what gets taught. You're the professor. The buck stops with you. It's not a democracy. Kids don't know what they need to know. You know what they need to know. You've been around longer. Don't even try to cover the material. There's not enough time. Uh, your job is not to cover the material. That's a student's job. Your job is to teach the tough things, the things they can't get for themselves. And by the way, the real learning happens when they do the problem sets in their, in their uh, <coughs> dorm rooms uh, well into the night. Encourage interruptions. Interruptions take time. So what? 
Uh, if the kid interrupts with a question, that means it's probably half the class didn't get it, and you'd be well served to explain what the, what the problem is. And never forget those three little words, critical to being a good teacher. Three little words, and of course you all know what they are, right? I don't know, that's right. If you bullshit them, and there's somebody in the room that knows, and there's always somebody that knows, you've lost all credibility for the rest of the semester. You may as well not teach, even try to teach after that. It's okay to not know. Better yet, if you say, I don't know, and then you uh, look it up, and then you come back and explain it to them. But even if you don't have time to do that, never be yes. And then the tenth one is reserved for future use. People say, ah, I can only think of nine. No. That's a commandment that says that contingencies need to be dealt with, see? And uh, you don't know what they are. The reason you don't know what they are is because you start the semester, you know, at compile time. You're scheduling the course. Course happens, it's run time. Things happen. You need to adjust. So it turns out I uh, was thinking about this because I had some time to think about it. I come up with other commandments. Uh, be real. That is, if you try to, you know, be the professor, you know, here, doctor. In fact, there's a guy at one of the German universities. Every time I see him, I say, oh, my God, I'd hate to be in his classroom. He's uh, posturing all the time. Be real. In fact, if you're real, you can get away with anything. You don't have to be polit politically correct if you're real, because the kids know you're not mean. Right? Being real is critically important. Be careful about adopting other people's styles, see? You, you look at, say, you, you like the way I teach. I'm supposed to know how to teach. Whether I do or not, you, got, you get to decide. I can't decide. But if you like some of the things I do, that may not work for you. You've got to be in your own groove. You've got to do what works for you. Don't be too quick to adopt somebody else. Leave your laptop at home. Uh, the best thing you can use is the blackboard or the whiteboard. Start with a clean sheet and you build. The blackboard is three dimensions. It's length, it's width, and it's time, okay? That is, you start with nothing and you just keep building. Now, I suppose you could do that with PowerPoint. It takes an enormous amount of effort that uh, it doesn't work. And it's also compile time. It's not run time. You know, you go doom, doom, doom with the PowerPoint. The blackboard, you're looking at the kids. You can see what, they don't get it. You can stick something else in there. Uh, be, beware of educators. So lately we have this thing called active learning. You know, you should waste classroom time having them work together. No. Classroom time is to explain things that are difficult to learn. They can work together after class. Right? This business of active learning makes you feel good. You know, everybody's contributing, everybody is uh, active. No. Classroom is for you delivering and paying attention so that you adjust as necessary and beware the latest bandwagon that you know, we've got to do it this way you know political correctness be careful about embracing it uh, Dershowitz a big-time uh, lawyer in the US he's a professor at the Harvard Law School and they asked him about uh, what he how he feels about political correctness and he feels the same way I do and he gave uh, he says you know you're so afraid to offend anybody that you just screw up the lecture because you have got to be careful you won't offend. In fact, I remember when I was teaching at Berkeley and I, I used the word girl. This is a true story. I used the word girl in my lecture. And I could see the women in the class, they just, it was like the, you could kind of look at the, you see the jugulars, you know. And I could see it because I don't lecture from notes. I have to keep my eyes on the students. How else can I tell whether they're getting it? And so uh, I, internally I said, wow, I've just offended all the females in the classroom. So I kept the sentence going, literally, for another five minutes until I could figure out a way to put the word boy into the same sentence. And they did visibly relax after I had done that. See. <laughs> you got to be careful. What I've found is that I can use the word girl, I can insult ethnic groups, etc. Can't do it the first lecture because they don't know that I'm real. But once they know you're real and you're not mean-spirited, then they're on your side, and you don't have to worry about this political correctness crap, which gets in the way. Okay, so what else I got to say? High tech in the classroom, I'm running out of time. Uh, high tech, 
this uh, putting a gold star on professors' heads, uh, which means giving them more money uh, if they use high tech. Um, I uh, I once lived with a um, a, uh, a woman who was a, a PhD in educational psychology, and she was telling me that a lot of the classrooms they use these fancy computers as doorstops, you know, to keep the door open because nobody knows how to use them anyway. Uh, this high tech is is over abused. I've already told you what I think of PowerPoint, and the good students will tell you. The, le the lecture will be improved 100% if the professor would leave his laptop or her laptop at home. You know, ka chung ka chung ka chung I want to invent the metronome, let the professor sleep in the corner, have the metronome step through the, the, the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, animations can be helpful, but most of the time the, the students get into this zone of watching rather than learning. Uh, clickers. You know, everybody's clicker happy today. So you can take attendance with clickers. Actually, you can't. The only thing you can do is know whose clickers came to the lecture. You can't tell what people came to the lectures. You know, I got a missed class. Here's my clicker. So this is boom, and he gets credit for the other kid. Clickers for testing. What you can test with a clicker, you all know about the clickers and the testing. So you ask a question, and they click on A, B, C, D, and then you can bar graphs, and then you tell them what the answer is. The level of question you can test is pretty superficial. Uh, there is other bookkeeping like Blackboard, which keeps track of grades, et cetera, which is good. In my case, the one place that I use high tech is email. So if, uh, email is high tech, right? Because 50 years ago, we didn't have email. So if a kid has a problem at 2 o'clock in the morning and he sends me email, then he, I, I'm a night person. Many of you probably know this. That. Um, I don't usually get up much before noon. I'm often in the office well into the middle of the night. Kid sends me email at 2 o'clock in the morning. He or she often gets a response at 2.30 in the morning. He goes, wow. You know, that's when the kid's having trouble. That's when I respond. And uh, there's a side benefit that the student knows the professor cares. And if the professor cares, then the student will care. Uh, there are a few caveats about high tech. One is that it gets rid of the extemporaneous effect. That is, uh, everything is canned, laid out with this high tech. There's also this visual voice disconnect, which we have here, but I speak so loud that maybe it doesn't matter with this small classroom. It certainly would matter when I'm teaching the freshman course of 400, which is to say, my voice is here and the video is, and the, uh, the visual is there, and that disconnect really makes a difference. With a whiteboard or a blackboard, the distance between what you're writing and what you're saying is the length of your arm. And that actually does matter. And then the business about attendance versus participation. Now that I'm old, I give these distinguished lectures at these, some of these universities. I think they want to extinguish lectures. They figure I'll be the last one. I got five minutes. Good, I may actually make it. Um, and I gave one at Carnegie Mellon this fall, and I gave one five years ago at Carnegie Mellon, and one of the senior professors told me the one I gave five years ago was much better. So we try to analyze it. Why was it much better five years ago? The only difference that I could see was PowerPoint versus the overheads. You know, I'd come in with a set of overheads and maybe I'd get through two or three of them during an hour. With PowerPoint, nobody ever interrupts. You're attending. You're in this zone of watching as opposed to participating. When I came in with overheads, I'd put the overhead on, somebody asked a question. I'd rifle through to find the overhead to answer the question. I'd put it down. Now, you've seen me lecture with the overheads. Yeah, nobody interrupts PowerPoint now. Plus the fact that well, I come in with 20 overheads. Now I come in with 50 of these things. You know, why? Because the first time it was 10, and you never take away PowerPoint. You always just add, and so it continues to grow, right? So, uh, random observations in no apparent order. It's not about feeling good. Uh, in the U.S., I don't know whether you have this problem in Europe or not, but in the U.S. we have this problem that the most important thing that kids should learn is to feel good about himself, that he's a valuable person whether or not he's getting it. I got a book for you to read, The Learning Gap, written by two American psychologists who visited a, uh, classrooms in Japan, Sendai, in China, Beijing, and in the U.S. And they didn't stack the deck. They picked a U.S. city that is better than most for education, Minneapolis. And they discovered one of the problems, so in Japan, the job of the teacher is to make the kid get it. And in the U.S., the job of the teacher is to make the kid feel good. You know, we used to play baseball. You strike out, you strike out. Now we play soccer or your game of football. 
So everybody gets in the game. You may not contribute to the game, but at least you're in there. And so at the end of the semester, at the end of the year, you get a medal. You know, the first time I ran the New York City Marathon, they gave me a medal for finishing. Went home, gave the medal to my father, who was in his 80s at the time. I said, Dad! He says, what's this? It's a medal. He says, I know. New York City Marathon. He said, wow, you won the New York City Marathon. <laughs> I said, no, Dad. I, uh, they give this one of these to everybody who finishes the New York City Marathon. He looked at me, and it was an incredible look on his face. You lost the New York City Marathon. <laughs> he couldn't believe that he had raised a loser, you know? Uh, university education should not be a buffet. Kids should not take what they want. They should take what they need, and that's your job. Exams, open book or closed book, multiple guests. You probably know what I think about multiple guests. In fact, I spend a huge amount of time preparing questions ahead of time so that I can grade 400 papers quickly and still make them think on each one of the problems. Open book or closed book, I can't do open book because they'll thrash, because the answer must be someplace. I can't do closed book because they'll memorize. And so what I do is closed book, but they can bring in three sheets of paper in which they can write anything. It has to be in their own handwriting. Pages can be this big if they want. Writing can be this small. And of course, it's a teaching tech, I have a learning technique to prepare for the exam. But that's how I handle the exam thing. TAs are important, teaching assistants. People that help you teach the course. You empower them. They will help make for a better course. Ah, for girls in the classroom. I don't know whether you have this problem in Europe. We certainly have it in the U.S. And so a little advice to, if you've got girls in your classroom, uh, make sure they don't buy into the male BS. You know, we raise little, at least in the U.S., we raise little boys and little girls differently. Uh, little girls tend to think before they open their mouths. We never have a problem opening our mouths when we're clueless, say. And so most of what comes out of our mouths is BS. And what it has the effect of doing is intimidating the females in the classroom. Because they say, wow, these guys know so much. You know, some, I, I keep threatening. I've never done it. But one of these days, I'm going to take the kid in the classroom who is the loudest mouth, thinks he knows everything, and I'm just going to Xerox the exam that he turns in and hand it out to all the girls in the classroom. They'll never be intimidated again, say. Uh, doing, make sure that you give them things to do. Education is not a spectator sport. And, you know, parallel is uh, the big deal these days, is thinking in parallel hard. I would ask, is thinking hard? By the way, I did an experiment in my freshman class this fall. I said, uh, supposing, uh, so you all know factorial, right? And yeah, you know, they're, they're UT freshmen, of course they know what factorial is. I say, okay, how many multiplies, multi, let's say multiply is a critical item in factorial. How many multiplies to, uh, to do 10 factorial? There I go, 10 times 9, times 8, times 7, times 6, times 5, times 4, times 3, times 2. You don't have to multiply by 1. That doesn't give you anything. 8 multiplies. I say, good. How about if uh, you had two processes and you could fork off, you know, have the other process. This is freshman. First exposure to computing. Now how many multiply, multiply times? And within two or three minutes, about half the class gets it. Correct answer. Ah, I'll have that process and do five factorial. Meanwhile, I'll do 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6. By the time I get that done, five factorial is computed. Only takes five multiply times. Uh, I wonder if uh, parallel is hard or because we tell everybody it's hard that we, as a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, hardware is parallel. Hardware is enormously parallel. In fact, one of the gurus in computer architecture who doesn't get it says uh, hardware uh, is uh, sequential. It's not sequential. It does go cycle by cycle, but in any one cycle, everything is working all the time. This electron doesn't go to that electron and say, after you, Mr. Electron. And this electron says, oh, no, 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 you're an older electron, you go first. No, all the electrons are working all the time. Right. Now, maybe the software is harder, I don't know. But anyway. Uh, and computing must become part of the engineering core, like math and physics have been forever. I have a bullet on, uh, and I'm going to skip this, I guess, because I'm clearly getting about out of time. 
but I strongly believe that computing ought to be a part of the engineering core for all engineering majors in the same way that math and physics is, and I've got several bullets up there uh, to indicate uh, why. In fact, maybe the last bullet is the most important, the concept of state, which is central to everything we do in computing. You know, you have a state, you do something, you have a new state, and that's central to all of engineering as well. So uh, I would argue for computing being taught by us for the mechanicals and the civils, etc. And finally, my last slide about students. A freshman can handle serious meat. You don't have to make the freshman course uh, Mickey Mouse. In fact, uh, fluff will turn off the good students, they'll drop out, and they'll go into biology or something challenging. And they don't need glitz. I've seen that over and over again. Uh, I assigned this example, this program for the right, the game of NIM. There's no color, there's no wow, it's just uh, NIM. You know, three, the, the game of NIM has three rows of matchsticks, and it's a two-person game. You pick up matchsticks, any number you want from one row, but only from one row, and when there's one matchstick left, then uh, the person picking up that last matchstick loses. So uh, what I do, instead of matchsticks, it's uh, three rows of X's on the screen. And the freshmen do it, and they're excited about it, and they go home for Thanksgiving and show it to their old man, and uh, it's wow, even though it's, there's no glitz whatsoever. I encourage them to study in groups that's not characteristic of engineering students. I think it ought to be law students understand that, that you do better when you study in groups. And everybody will do better. Even pair programming, which is one of these latest things, you know, have the kids uh, program in pairs, so you give them a program and two people Two students work together, and that's okay, provided that you don't count it toward their grade, right? Because you don't know who did the work. But it's good for learning. Working in groups is good for learning. It's not good for testing. And the final bullet is that students memorize for only one reason. And I'm done. So that I run over or not? Mm. Don't say you. Unless you unless you can. Is that okay? Because uh, your colleague was afraid that anything I said was going to be useless in, in teaching. All right, good. You never say never something which is useless. Uh, okay, you got my second talk. <laughs> ah. <laughs>